Welcome back to yet another podcast episode. Now, you may or may not have noticed we're doing things a little bit differently. We're still doing the audio experience on iTunes and SoundCloud and Spotify and all that's fine and dandy. But we also have video versions of each one of these episodes coming out. So if you'd rather watch and not just listen, you can join the conversation at Lucas Rubik's on YouTube and you'll find the podcast episode there. With that said, today's episode was really inspiring to me and I know it'll be inspiring to you. We have a conversation with Taylor Welch and it's a conversation that most of us never have. I never had it in school with any teachers or anything in the curriculum when I was growing up. I never had it with my family or my dad or my grandparents or anyone in my family. I've hired so many coaches. I've been parts of so many masterminds and I've gotten to talk to many quote unquote successful people. And I truly believe that there's different measurements of success, but I'm talking about financially successful people who still didn't have this conversation with me. Most of the conversations were around how do you make money? That's a skill we got to learn. How do you exchange something of value for revenue, for sales? How do you protect your profits? All that fun stuff. And we have that conversation on this podcast often. What is not talked about and what really was enlightening for me was now that you're making the money, what do you do with it? And I know for myself, I was just stacking cash under the mattress. At one point, I was sitting on five hundred dollars or $600,000 of cash and I was terrified of, I didn't know what to do with it. I felt like I had an identity that, hey, I know how to make money, but I'm not an investor. That's for the other guys. That's for Wall Street. That's for the smart people. You know, I guess I'll just be happy with what I have. And probably in January, I I heard Taylor talk a lot about wealth creation and investing. And Taylor has this way of challenging you to really question everything you know, challenging you to expand your vision, step into a new identity, And to me, my vision was build a million dollar business. I thought that was like climbing Mount Everest. And when I did build a million dollar business, when I did see a $100,000 month, I was like, is that all there is? There has to be room for expansion. There has to be more impact I can create. There has to be another level of the game. And ultimately, that's what this episode is all about. So if you'd like to join a conversation around finances, around wealth, around expansion, and you'd like to learn it from a guy who walks his talk. This guy has built, and his partner, Chris Evans, has built multiple companies in really short periods of time. And over the last four or five years, and excuse me if my timetable is a little bit off there, they've gone on to create over $100 million every year in revenue across all of their companies. And so that's someone that I want to learn from. So with that said, if you'd like to join the conversation, join us and enjoy the episode. So, so I wanted to start this off by three things. I got, I got three things to say. One, I've been really careful to study people, especially in this financial world, who seem to have both figured out. And I'm talking about the money side and then the fulfillment, life, family side. Because through my journey of trying to find financial people to listen to, I found a lot of 60, 70 year old overweight, seemingly unhappy. Now I can't judge that, but just from what I've been getting, I'm like, man, they have the money side figured out, but they don't necessarily, I feel have the life or it's not the life I'd want. They seem like they've gone through three divorces, all this stuff. And I'm like, great, you figure out the money, but I want both. And you, from, from at least what I see, you've got both figured out. True, false. I'm sure you're like, there's so much more to figure out, but I feel like you have a really nice balance. True. True. Two, and I kind of mentioned this right before we started, but I wanted to give thanks. And to anyone listening who is making money, but is scared to deploy it or is scared to use it or has some fears like I did. I grew up in a trailer park. And so I think I was, got great at making money, continued to get better, but I was terrified of deploying it because I was like, I didn't understand. I think I just didn't understand how financial, the financial world works. And you said this one thing that put me into pain. Cause I was saying like, I'm good. I got it figured out. I can make money. And I was wondering what's next. And you said, you talked about inflation and I actually did the calculation on like five or $600,000 I had sitting there. And I'm like, I should probably do something with this. Cause I'm losing 50, 60 grand a year. And I've worked hard for this. So yeah. I deployed half of it and you know, my life hasn't changed, but who I am has changed on a massive level of how I understand money. And I'm just scratching the surface. Like I'm like just scratching it. So anyone listening who 
feels like they're in that same boat. I think this is going to be, I know this is going to be really, really beneficial. So I wanted to thank you for that. You're welcome. Third thing, every time, and we, this came up once before, is, is I feel like you do these small jabs at Canadians. And we have a lot of Canadian <laughs> listeners. I just, want to, I just want to set that record straight. I'm trying to, I just want to set that record straight, but I'll just move the mic on to you to, um, to let me know what's up with the Canadian. So, you know, so here's the deal. I, I love Canadians. We have uh, Canadian employees and they're, y'all are the best, the best ever. I will never forget the first time I was in Canada though. And this is a serious traumatic event for me. Okay. Wait, uh, I was, was part of Canada. I was, we flew into Banff. Yeah. No, no, no. Uh, Calgary. We flew into Calgary. We were going to Banff. Yeah. I was detained in the airport for like three oh. hours. And I'm like, I'm an American. Like we're supposed to be best friends. Like, like just picture Canada without America for a minute and you'll get the picture. It's not a pretty picture. I get it. I get it. It's like we're yeah. allies here. Sure. And this, this, you know, person had me in this room and they thought that I was there to like do business in Canada. And, um, uh, you know, if, if Sunshine Mountain and Banff weren't just the most amazing place in the, that I've ever been in the world, I would really hold mm. it against you guys. But I think that it was, you know, it was a traumatic experience. And so now I'm just like, Hey, what's up with Canada? Well, that, that, would paint with Canadians? A, that would paint a, a bad picture. I guess every time I've gone to the States, which is probably 50 times, I've never had a problem. Every time I came back, uh, not every time, three times I've come back to Canada, it's been two or three hours of secondary See? and all this stuff. And I'm just like, that's kind of weird. Like Americans are cool with Canadians. Canadians aren't cool with us. And so sometimes that's I'm true. like, hey, what's the deal here? All right. All right. Well, that's, I'm that's, sorry. That's I, just, I apologize for the jabs, though. It's all it's all from a place of love. If I don't that's love, if I don't love you, I'm not going to make fun of you. You know what I'm saying? I'm okay. just going to ignore you. That's set straight. Got that. Um, I was going through your Twitter feed for probably 30 minutes yesterday. Not huge on Twitter, although I highly recommend if you are go follow Taylor. I was going through your feed and I was like, there's like, I've been reading a ton of financial books and it's just little, it was like a little financial, like a little financial Buddha who's just giving out all these gems. And I'm just like, just extremely impressed with your depth and your understanding of and your conviction, I think that's what gets me the most, is your conviction um, around the topic of finances, the topic of investing. Yeah, Twitter is new for me as well. I got on uh, at the time of this recording um, about three and a half months ago. Oh, okay. Um, and it just kind of blew up. So I haven't been on Twitter for a long time, but I am very convicted because once you learn, once I learned the rules, and it's, it's like to circle back to something that you said earlier with inflation, I'm, I'm good friends with the guy who's really big in uh, the online space. It's very successful. And he actually flew out to Nashville. We spent uh, a couple of days together and we we're talking about permanent insurance, whole life investments. So he's like, how much cash on hand do you have? And I told him, he was like, that's it. I was like, dude, no, no, no. The game is being able to convert fiat currency, which all that means is like basically government backed fake paper money into assets. And that was the first time that I developed kind of the IP. So last year around levels of wealth, uh, currency manipulation, conversion of currencies into assets, things like that. And so I think a lot of people are surprised or taken back because we talk about our revenues pretty openly and we will, we'll, we're pretty close to hundred million annual uh, on everything combined. And uh, when you look at our cash on hand, it's like, you know, it's, it's not what people would expect. And the reason is because I don't want a devaluing asset that's losing money are losing value every single day. And so Twitter has been, you know, kind of a place where you know, I think people expect me to talk about one thing. I'm just like, hey, how do you get clients? Right. It's like, right. I'm, I'm right. not talking about that on Twitter. I'm talking about real estate and currency and asset backed, uh, you know, cryptocurrency and blockchain and NFTs and you know, all of the above. So it's been a lot of fun and it's kind of blown up. So we'll I, I think what, what blows my mind the most is, and I, I'm going to have this off a little bit, but probably it's been like a five or six year journey off on that a little bit, like since you actually were like, I'm gonna start a business, I'm gonna make something, uh, you know, of my life to getting into a hundred million dollars across all your companies per year. Like yeah, that, that's, 2000, that's pretty 2015. Cool. 2015, so yeah, that's insane. And yeah. and I don't wanna get, I was searching everywhere on the internet and I couldn't get it. 31, 32 years old, 30 years old? 32. It just, it, it blows my mind. Cause again, every financial book I read is, 
by someone who's 60 or 70. And obviously there's a ton of wisdom that comes with that and a ton of learning from it, but I don't see many, any 32 year olds that I feel have the depth of understanding that you have. So, um, I've been, I've been, I got pages of notes just from your Twitters and just from your Instagrams and just from the stuff you teach, including the levels of wealth, which I know you have a webinar and a presentation on that. We'll make sure we just leave links below for everything you guys put up. Awesome. Um, cool. So, so I, I kind of wanted to split this into two because I think there's a big mindset identity piece of it that finally clicked for me when you kind of not knowingly, but you kind of leveraged my pain to be like, I need to do something about this because this is the next level of, of who I want to become. So there's this identity piece and I don't, I don't know many people who have been given a lot. So everyone I know who's earning a ton has made it from nothing, but I can identify now in them of I've made it. I need to, I need to keep it safe. I need to store it. I don't want to lose it. Um, and that was a painful process for me. And I'm still going through that process of like, okay, I want to deploy it. I want to, the market shifts like it did over the last few days over stuff in China. And I'm just like, whoa, there goes 30, 40 grand. That's new to me. Let me just keep stepping into it and buy more on these kind of dips. Um, I wanted to chat about that first and maybe entangle it with your story. Cause I don't believe you came from, you know, the golden spoon story. Yeah. Um, no, I, I definitely did not My, I, I wasn't, I'll, I'll put it this way. Um, I do think that I got lucky and blessed, whatever you want to call it. I was, uh, raised, you know, in, in, I wasn't raised in poverty. Um, uh, my, my dad did all right, but I didn't learn about, I didn't, I didn't have to learn about money until my family went through a bankruptcy, which is not the time you want to learn about money. You, you want to, you, ideally you want to learn in a controlled environment. It's, it kind of be like learning how to be a soldier, like by being dropped off in the middle of a battle. It's like not the best time to train, you know? Um, and so, you know, I had to go through, the ups and downs of that. And, you know, when I was my first year in college, uh, my family went through bankruptcy and, you know, that was the first time that I had ever thought about money at all, period, ever in college. It's like, people look right. at that and they're like, you know, you could call that a golden spoon. Um, you could be like, Oh, well, you, you never, you didn't have to think about not having enough until you were in college. It's like, come on, bro. Like that's pretty good. So I think right. I was, I was lucky in that regard. Um, but it, I was also like, I didn't have any of the requisite experience or understanding to know how to navigate through that. So, you know, I went through several years of my life, not knowing how to pay for gas uh, for the car or, you know, who, how to pay for anything. You know, I, I remember specifically one time um, having, a, I split an apartment in Springfield, Missouri with somebody. And this is after my dad had gone through the bankruptcy and I was just, I was waiting tables and, um, I didn't have the money to pay for rent. And I had no idea what I was going to do because my shifts had been given away to somebody else uh, at the restaurant. No control, man. No control, like right. zero. And, um, you know, I remember telling my roommate, I was like, I don't know what we're going to do. And he's like, well, I don't have it to pay for it. Like, so you have to figure out how to pay for it. And um, literally remember just sitting down and like praying to God, like, help me figure out how to get this money. And it was like $487 or something, something silly. Um, and the day before it showed up in the mailbox and I hadn't told anybody, like I hadn't, I'd just been, I just asked God to get it for me. And it was like, Oh my goodness. Like, you know, the, the idea here is like, there are rules that undergird the, the money universe, but you have to kind of, you know, the, the universe or God or whatever wants to take care of you, but you have to participate in that process. And so um, it took me like six or seven years to get to the place of being able to just not run out of money. And then it took me another two or three years to kind of like get the business acumen that I needed to get started. Uh, but no, man, it came from like, I would say kind of traumatic event uh, in, in terms of money. That was my experience. Yeah, and I think it's just important to note because every time I'm learning from someone, I really want to know their story so I can understand their perspective and where they come from. So I think a lot of people relate to that story is we weren't in poverty, but it, I mean, struggling to pay gas or rent. I well, think dude, sometimes it's worse. That, so. Sometimes average is worse. 100%. 100%. What's the the feeling? This is kind of a selfish question, but I was, I'm just kind of actually interested in it right now because I know um, 
there's a feeling like when we hit 100K a month, I thought I'd be set for life. And I was like, wow, this is just the beginning. And um, I think a lot of people experience that. What's the feeling or is it almost the same thing of like $100 million a month? I think you just posted recently do 100K a month, just passive through just the real estate um, company you built. I'm just like that money is life changing. You had one Instagram post that I wrote down about uh, I've purchased purchased just about everything I want, the cars or the the, you know, the, the watches or whatever. And then you put, um, it's, it's life is about the moments you were hanging out with your daughter, I think. And you were like, this is yeah, yeah. important. Life is about moments. And that's probably pretty, you know, hard to imagine for most of us is that moment where it's like, this is, I, I've got generational wealth at this point. Um, and you, you must think about how far you've come in six, seven, eight years. What's, what's, what's the feeling behind that? Or what's, what's that feel like? Uh, I think it's complicated. <laughs> it's, it's not just one feeling. Um, and to be honest, it's, it's funny because I think that you would think that it feels like this euphoria and it's like, my life is finally safe and right. finally com complete. But if you like really study the people at the top of the game, uh, that have been there for a long time, they, they just keep enlarging the, yeah. the scope of yeah. the game itself. And so for me, it's like, you know, this is probably not the answer that you want me to say, but it is the honest answer, which is the one that I'll give you is uh, in many, in many ways, it feels the same that it felt in 2016 because the game has gotten bigger for me. And so I do not feel uh, I, I tell people now I've, I've, I've gone through the, the trenches enough to kind of know the patterns and um, you, people set criteria for their lives that are one sided, one side of the coin. And they, they just they create clarity around what they want to have and how much money they want to make and what they want it to look like. But they fail. They forget to create clarity around what they want it to feel like, which is the complete opposite of what you have. It's not it's not how successful you are. It's it's how how do you feel about how successful you are. And I've met people who, you know, I've met people who have really challenged me because they, they don't have a fraction of what I have, but they are way happier yeah. than I am. And I'm like, Oh man, there's something wrong. Like I need to make sure that I participate in, you know, getting clarity around what I want this to feel like. And then I've also been challenged in moments of my life when, you know, I've come off of a big, a big win. Um, and it just let me down. Whereas like, I didn't get any satisfaction from it like this. I thought it would, I thought it would be a lot more enlightening and a lot more you know, satisfying than what it ultimately was. And so how does it feel? It feels like I have a lot of life left. It feels like I'm very young. It feels like, uh, there's way more for me to do, but at the same time, um, my, uh, my drive, I'm, I am, blessed now to have a drive that comes from vision, not necessarily safety. I was talking with a young man this morning who's an executive on the real estate side. And I was like, you know, you are beginning to miss your targets because you have lost that visionary drive. And your drive is now like you're running from something. You're not running to something else. And some people got to be careful that they don't they don't set the vision and the throughput of their life based on well, I don't want to be poor. Or I don't want to struggle with this. Or I don't want to struggle. So what do you want? You ask, you find somebody in your life, you're like, what do you want? And they're going to list off a bunch of things they don't want. It's like, well, why are you giving me the counterfactual? You have no vision. All you have is pain. And you're trying to run from that pain. But that's not necessarily longevity inducing drive and energy. You know what I'm saying? So 100%. really, really long answer to say it feels about the same that it felt at the beginning. It's just a lot more fun because the game is not do or die anymore. It's just levels. Yeah. You know what I mean? I, well, I'm happy with that answer because I've heard that from every person whom I've, you know, wanted to model or learn from who's still in the game. They haven't been like, yeah. now I'm here. And so they just have so much passion and life. And they say the same thing. It feels like it feels the exact same. I just have more options and I can, I can yeah. play the game at a different level. So I'm happy with that answer. I love that. Um, when it comes to the the mindset piece, was this something that, or the identity piece, was this something that 
you, you obviously figured out the lead gen, the marketing game. You were able to pump your company with tons of opportunities and, and you quickly built that. So was there moments where you were, I'll use the word sabotage. It's not really the right word, but I'll use it where, because I've identified this in my life where I come up against a new level and then I literally just sabotage my financial position because I am not ready or I haven't wanted to accept that. Or did you not, did you have that same experience where you had to consciously, I need to upgrade myself right now? Or was it just naturally through building a company? Um, Like internal, the way I think and things like that. Yeah. Right. And your um, ability to like, to drop, like, I remember, I, I think 40,000 or $45,000 we were um, to run our business. And three years ago, if I made that in a month, I would have been super happy. So obviously I don't know how many millions you spend to run your companies, but there's a level of fear that I go through every time we have a new step cost and I'm like, okay, we're yeah. forced to level up. We're going to bring on someone new. I'm being forced to level up. And so I do it. Was that your experience or was it easier for you? And no, I don't think it's easier for anybody unless you're a psychopath. I think if you're crazy, like to the point where you don't feel anything, then it's easy, uh, which is obviously not a good trade off. You know, so then but it I, does come to, yeah. No, I mean, like what, what you, what I had to realize, especially at the beginning is that any choice that I made from a place of circumstance was ultimately going to probably hurt me long-term, uh, but it was going to feel comfortable short-term. Any play, any choice that I made from a place of vision was going to hurt me short-term, but it was going to help me long-term. So I don't think that it's necessarily like, man, how do you get over your fear? It's, you don't. You've got to just pick what you're more afraid of. People don't necessarily grow out of fear. It's been around for like, like however many years you think humanity has been around. We've always had fear. Like I'm, I'm afraid of falling out a window because I would die. Like that's probably a healthy thing to be afraid of. However, yeah. Yeah. we we don't. Sometimes we don't stay in control of what we're actually afraid of, and so we just get subjected to these random evolutionary fears. And it's like you know, being ostracized from your tribe and starving to death 7,000 years ago is very different than not having any likes on your Twitter post. Right. But we right. group them together. And so we be begin to make decisions based on unhealthy fear that should really be prioritized down to the bottom of the list. Does that make sense? It makes hundred percent sense. So I know you're huge on the vision piece because that seems like what you always anchor back to is I've had this vision and I kept expanding the vision and I kept yep. getting pulled to it. How I know for my life, like this podcast and just actually getting my ass onto a plane and flying somewhere else to get around someone who's 10 times further than I have been, has been the game changer. Cause I get a glimpse into what's possible. And for my little world that I live in here in Canada, in this small town that we moved to, uh, hard to get that perspective. So me actually flying places has been huge, has, um, has environment and, and the connections that you paid for that you made was, has it been a huge factor? Yeah, I think the biggest one uh, we paid for back in the day was Jay. Right. Um, and yeah, I mean, I, I told that story just a few weeks ago at an event that I was speaking at $120,000 for six months. And at the time, it was a lot of money. It was, yeah. it was a lot of money to, to drop for six months. Yeah. Um, yeah. But we did it. And I think that just that connection was really helpful because identity is a fluid thing. It's not a static thing. Identity is not a destination that you arrive at. Identity is is a... Uh, it's a it's a constantly updating algorithm that lives inside your head. And what impacts that more than anything else is really it's osmosis. I mean, it's right. It, it's the people you're around, the car that you drive, the place that you live. And yeah. you can it is possible to get so good that you are your own osmosis. Like right now, you know, I could pull up a vision of me 10 years from now. I gonna burn the world down, dude. Like there's. I'm playing the game. I'm playing the game at a level that I don't, I, I've never seen anybody else play before. Uh, I, you know, I've got 17,000 single family properties across the United States. Like I'm, I'm going, going, going. Well, I can compare myself to that person and there's osmosis there, but that's a skill set that has to be developed. And you're not going to skip to that. You're going to have to start with like, okay, well, this person's a couple steps ahead of me. How do I get around them? Uh, and it's just like anything else. Like when you start in the gym, you should probably get a personal trainer. But after 10 years, you might be able to train by yourself because you know all of the rules and you know how your muscles respond and you've figured out the diet and the schedule and the, the drive and all of those yeah. things. And so everybody starts at a certain level and it's going to be a waste of time for you to try to skip over levels that you weren't necessarily designed to skip past. Right. 
hundred percent, hundred percent. So, so moving from that, so from the identity piece into the actual, you know, the, the, the tactical or the knowledge or the information or the wisdom, I am going to do my best. And I've been studying this for maybe seven months now. And I found that when I first got into the financial world, I knew I listened to video and I didn't know what they're talking about, but as I kept studying, I started understanding the terminology and the language and the words they're using. And it all started making sense, like learning anything new. So I'll probably use very basic language, but you're welcome to correct or steer it whatever way we have to. But I, I know you kind of start the levels of wealth and you had this great thing about uh, poor, rich, wealthy and legacy. And it hit me because I was like, OK, I'm kind of like in the, you know, I, I figured out how to make money, but now I need to learn how to deploy it. Um, want to talk about that or start the conversation around levels of wealth? I know you had pumps, buckets, boats, and that all just made so much sense to me for the first time in my life. And I'm sure it'll help the audience on, on that side. Yeah. So um, there's a new book that I'm writing that's coming out next year. And so, you know, at some point in the future, and people are, are listening to this, they'll just be able to go search on Amazon. But the, the idea is that, you know, there's, there's four levels of the game, three levels we can ascend through when we are alive. And one level is reserved for the dead of poor, rich, wealthy, and immortal. And the poor people, it's not a derogatory thing. It is, it is, uh, they're just doing the wrong things. And, you know, I have like, one of my passions is helping people like this with information and education and technology, uh, because the reality of the situation is like, not everybody's poor because they just choose to do the wrong things. So a lot of people are poor because they don't know the right things to do. They've never been taught. Nobody's, nobody's partnered with them. The, the, the areas that they grew up and the family they grew up with. And so we have a lot of different, you know, uh, initiatives that we're putting out into the world right now, just to help people uh, who do not know what they don't know. It sounds simple, right. but it's, I, I hate more than anything, this dumb, like internet marketing culture is like, I'm self-made the hell you are right. like, no, right. no human being is self-made. And I think it's the, it's the peak of arrogance and entitlement to really believe that, Hey, you're, you're poor. If you choose to be, when you choose to be poor, it's like, Nope, there are some people right. that have never been taught the game. I'm just going in on that. Cause it's like, it's something that's bothering me right I mean, now, that's but data, that, that's data backed. Cause they, they did that thing on zip code is your zip code will determine your financial situation yes. more than anything else. Yes. So you've got the poor and the poor do the wrong thing. You got rich and, you know, rich doesn't, rich is like that whole entire category where it's like, you have enough, you have enough. Um, and if you're listening to this podcast, like the chances of you being rich are really high because you probably, you have internet, you have a device, you're watching this on like, if you have access to podcasts, you're probably rich, you know, like compare yourself to the rest of the world. And then you have the level above rich and that, that is wealthy. So poor do the wrong things, rich, they do the right things, wealthy, they own the right things. And that's the distinction right. is doing versus owning. And then inside of these tiers, there's also, uh, you know, what people do with money, poor people spend it, rich people store it and wealthy people multiply it. It's all about multiplication, turning $1 into two, into four, into eight, into 16, et cetera. And the goal of, of my work over the next 20 years is going to really help people. I want to help people ascend up through the levels, whether they're starting poor, whether they're starting rich, ultimately we should all get to a place of wealth where our money is multiplying itself. And then you get into this place of immortality when the work that you do while you're here outlives your own physical life. And that's like, you know, I had Kate, my daughter in 2019, she's two and a half. She's very smart. She might be too smart. It might be a problem. I don't know. Uh, but it was, it's the most incredible thing ever. And I'm like, you know what? Mm. You're going to live longer than I am. And I want to equip you with everything necessary so that you can be more successful. I never understood this, man. When my dad would say like, I want you to be more successful than me. I'm like, no, you don't. It doesn't make any sense. Like, why would you wish someone else was more successful than you are? And then Kate got here and I was like, I want you to right. be way more successful than me because I care about you more than I care about me. It's legacy, right. it's generational. It's going to outlast me. And so making sure that, you know, your assets are set up in a way so that you can die physically, but your message and the resources you pass on are immortal, generational. And so that's the, that's the peak that we all want to get to. 
And you're living proof that you're well on your way, or you're probably already into the legacy, but I'm sure there's so much you want to go. Like you just said, 20 years, I'm always impressed by your ability to, and, and people who do big things, their ability to, I'm like five years ahead and I'm trying to stretch this to like 10 years, but people are like, dude, in 50 years, this is where I'll be. And I'm like, you're going to be, you're going to be dead by then, but you're already thinking 50 or hundred years in the future. It's, it's fascinating to, to see. Um, so, so then when I, when you said that and you were like, Hey, wealthy people own the right things. I was like, okay, I, I have enough to like start owning things, but I also had to take it into account. And that's where the world got really mm, challenging for me because I was looking at all these different investment opportunities and all these different channels and all these different vehicles. I'm in Canada, mandatory vaccine passports are rolling out. We're not staying here. Like we're, we're two or three weeks away from leaving the country. So I had to keep assets that are, that I can move around and sell if I need to and didn't want to get into real estate. And I, I had to kind of take into my situation to account. So I got into crypto and best decision ever. And that's been an insane ride and, and a lot of fun, but it's also highly volatile. If someone's in that situation where they, they've got a little bit of money, but they're like, I was terrified because they don't understand it. And I think when you don't understand something, you're going to be scared what to invest it in, what to do. I know you had a bit of a guideline or a bit of a, a model that you followed on how you invested your money. Care to share any thoughts on that? Yeah, sure. Um, you know, foundation one is just going to be to keep a certain amount of money in, in whatever fiat currency you, you denominate in, um, you know, so USD or pounds or, or whatever, uh, you want to keep a portion there just so you can have easy mobility and you can like buy groceries and, you know, survive. Um, the number for me is around 10% of annual cash flow. I want about 10% and, and none of this is financial advice. I'm not a financial advisor. Um, you know, we have to do the, the traditional caveats here of, um, you know, listen to me at your own risk, blah, blah, blah. Uh, but 10% of my annual cash flow, that's it. I, I only want to keep 10%, which is why this guy was like, oh my God, I figured you'd have like right. way more cash on hand. And it's like, no, and I'm not going to carry a, a fiat currency that is like getting like 8% less valuable per year. That makes zero sense. That doesn't sound smart at all. So I'm going to cap that. At around ten percent, but sometimes it's, it's fifteen. It's it takes. Sometimes you have to find an investor sure. to put it in. Um, and then I like real estate. That's my favorite asset class ever. Um, I have it on good authority that will probably still want houses to live in in the next hundred years. Now I don't know. Who knows? Uh, but it's going to be difficult to escape this idea of not wanting to sleep in the rain. I, I yeah. just don't think we're gonna. Yeah. Fair. We're going to outlive that. And so you know, people are always like, well, real estate's really risky too. And I'm like, man, it's just, it's not as risky as you think because people want houses and we're betting on human nature. Um, so my main allocation right now is real estate. And there's two levels inside of that. One is like real estate backed, uh, real estate backed funds or, um, you know, investment trusts or what whatnot. And then actual tangible uh, property that you can own. Now, it's going to change. Like, are you moving to the United States? Uh, no, just because they're requiring Canadians to get vaccines. So it's Mexico. It. So, it's you, so you, do you hate Americans? Got it. Okay. So, well, okay. If it depends on what country you are, but, uh, you know, if you're in the United States, you have some really cool lending laws that you can like, or, or debt packages that you can participate in. Um, but wherever you are, like it's, it's genu generally going to be a decent bet to have some sort of, uh, capital tied up in some real estate. Um, and then on top of that, I've got kind of my, um, things that I think are, are going to grow in the future, but not 100% sure. Um, uh, you could put, you know, DeFi into that. You know, crypto is, is like crypto is, is weird because do you want to go down the crypto rabbit hole for a minute? I put a note. I'm like, wow, that can, that can lead into uh, five hours, but I'd love to, we can, we can touch so, on okay. it. Sure. All right. So uh, crypto is phenomenal, um, but it's not an, it's not really an investment. It's a currency. And so when you get into DeFi though, it, it can be an yeah. investment. So that actually takes crypto and it flips it into an investment class. So you've got um, all, all of these different exchanges that you can put money into. You can do uh, yield farming. You can just do basic lending. So you provide liquidity uh, and, and you get paid on that. But here's the thing about, about crypto is 
when like before the gold standard went away, we had a currency that was backed by something real. And so the, the laws of, of nature itself enforced a long time horizon on money. And this is called um, time, money, uh, time preference of money. You can Google it. It's a real thing, time preference of money. When, when the time preference of money it is good and healthy, what it means is that a, a civilization's currency is, is going to always get more valuable in proportion to the goods that it buys. So if you literally go back like forever ago, you know, you're just bartering. They don't have any currency. They're just bartering. It's like, hey, you know, you have food. I make shoes. How about I trade some shoes for food? But, you know, if if food uh, supply goes down, then all of a sudden it requires so many shoes to buy the same amount of food that it's no longer a good trade because the farmer's like, I don't need 7,000 pairs of shoes. It's not a good trade. So when we invented currency, it flipped the entire world on its head because all of a sudden we had a medium or a, a modality to just say, hey, this is worth something. We're going to let someone else decide what it's worth, but it's going to be backed up by something real. And so metals like precious metals were the longest lasting ones, but we've used beads, we've used rocks, like we've used all sorts of things to be currency. The gold backed, it was precious metal backed currency. It kept the currency flat and at some points increasing because right. as we as the supply and demand curves changed it we it required about the same amount of money to buy something in 1920 that it did in 1820 right you with me so far right yeah makes sense okay what what happened when we got off the gold standard is, standard is everything changed and the entire uh the entire engineering of the federal reserve monetary system that we're on now is it's really exploitative because $100,000 that gets paid to you today, it's the most valuable that 100 grand will ever be in the rest of your life. Mm -hmm. Like tomorrow it's less valuable. The next day it's less valuable. The day after that it's less valuable. So what are you incentivized to do? Spend it. You're going to get the maximum utility out of the money right now if you spend it. If you decide not to spend it, you'll get less utility out of it tomorrow, less the next day, less the next day. So we've engineered the system based on velocity, not on long-term generational wealth. So people were like, man, what's, that's, right. what's the wealth gap about? Yo, we literally jacked the wealth gap up a hundred fold because we incentivize everybody in civilization to spend their money. Right. So that's where we are current day. Cryptocurrency, Bitcoin, Bitcoin is probably the only one really engineered to replace you know, the, uh, the reserve currency of the world. It's 21 million. That's all you get. You don't get any more. And so what's what happens is, you know, a year from now, it requires less currency to pay for the same things that it required a year earlier. Right. Whereas fiat, it requires more currency a year from now than it does a year earlier. And so when you put money into something that is fixed in the supply, then it's a pretty good bet that that's going to increase. And that's where we bet. That's where humanity was for thousands of years until we exited uh, yeah. the gold standard. And so like I'm, I have a significant portion of what you would call liquidity in cryptocurrency because like fiat is dead. Like there's no way it's fiat can't really rebound uh, unless there are serious changes made on a global front, not just in the United States, but like it's going to have to be a globally engineered redesign of the monetary system but I think it's too far. Like it's too far gone. I've been obsessed with this dude, uh, Raul Paul. I'm not sure if you know, he was a yeah. micro investor for like 30 years and I love his yeah. long view on user adoption of crypto and different technologies and the, the network effect that's happening through Ethereum networks and all the different NFTs. And it, it's such a fascinating world to me. So that's why I went into that because I literally don't know where I'm going to be in six months. Um, my next step is once I get a little more solidified on where I'm going to physically live, um, then physical assets and houses and all that stuff is going to be next. So it's been, it's been a super fun game to play. Um, is it, and I've been asking myself this question a lot, is it, I'm curious on your view, because it seems like there's a wide spectrum If Tony Robbins will say, start investing in index funds when you're 12 years old and just put $10 a month, start investing in it. I think an entrepreneurial mind will be like, invest in the company first, if you believe in it, so you can build that 
take all those profits. You call them pumps, um, buckets and boats. When should someone, and I know this is an advice and it totally depends on where someone's at in their life, but when do you think someone can actually start really making moves into, I'm going to build wealth because you probably can't do that on a hundred or $500 a month of putting it into your wealth bucket. There's probably some kind of tipping point where now you can really start building stuff. Any ideas on that? Yeah, I think there's nothing wrong with putting money into uh, investments early. However, you have to make sure your expectations are set up correctly because there, there's only there's only two things that a person should pay attention to with investment. Yield is number one, time is number two. That's it, you have two, you have two levers here, yields and time. And uh, when it comes down to it, a yield includes the percentage of return and the, re the return capital both of them. So if you have a yield of 30% on $50, it doesn't matter. It literally doesn't matter. You have $50. It's not going to do anything, but 30% on 5 million. It's like, Oh, like let's put you're you're on the wall street journal. Like you're everywhere. Like you are the king of finance. I mean, Buffett is like way under that, you know, for the last 8,000 years that he's been alive. Yeah. So I think that, while I, I'm not going to say don't invest until you until you hit a certain point, I, I do believe that uh, people who are are struggling to get the requisite capital to make a significant investment into something, they should invest into learning how to right. create more value. And that doesn't necessarily mean that you have to be a business owner. You know, like there are people on our staff today that like make really, really good money and they're they've invested into their ability to create value. And to be more valuable, and they're more valuable this year than they were last year. And so, I would say, if you're at a company that va that values you and the value that you produce, you're probably going to be okay. Um, if you have ten dollars of surplus per month, you're going to struggle. And so, the first step is increasing your income. You want to increase that income as fast as you can. Once you have a reasonable surplus, which is just like cash flow, pretty much, invest that as soon as you can. Because if you start investing when you're 12. Yeah, like you're going to be a legend when you're like 40 years old, you know, that compounding is going to start hitting. Right. And so you're probably because you have this uh, keep 10 or 15 percent in fiat or, or how you do it. And then you got real estate, you got your uh, crypto DeFi, all that stuff, uh, probably find a strategy that lines up with someone's life and where they want to be set realistic expectations and then just stick to that uh, yeah. allocation of, of cash flow, no matter what type thing. Yeah, hundred percent. But people people want to know, like, well, how much of my income should I invest into uh, to assets? I'm like, that doesn't make any sense. Yeah, that doesn't. I don't understand the question. And here's why. You know, what I what I I flip that question around. I'm like, how much of my income am I going to burn? You know, in other words, eat and spend on lifestyle, and then I'm going to invest a hundred percent of the rest into my asset plan. And so sometimes, sometimes that just has a weird, it has a weird effect on your psychology, and it will make you work harder. You know, like I'm, I was just like coming off of last month, you know, we had two businesses that needed reconfigured. The real estate business ate a lot of money last month. And so, you know, I'm looking around like, yo, I don't have a lot of cash. I mean, I do compared to the normal person, but for what I'm used to, like, I don't have a ton of cash right now. Um, and I'm way below my 10% because the, the income coming off of the companies wasn't what I wanted it or needed it to be. And so sometimes it's actually a really healthy thing because what it has done for me is I'm like, yo, I better go. It's time to run. Like, I don't, I don't have, I don't have nine years of operating expenses stuck in a bank account somewhere. So, and it's not neediness. It's just like, yo, I probably need to work on this. Like I need to, I need to bolster my income a little bit. And what I see more than anything else is people will get to like their income targets. They'll stockpile everything. And then right. it's like, they're just like, I don't have to do anything. And they end up falling off the mat, moving backwards. And once they realize that they've moved backwards, they're incredibly disappointed and frustrated. But what I'd rather do in the middle is like, man, I take the money, split it up into my different accounts. I have a little amount of capital that I keep as liquid. The rest is put into assets. And you notice that like my net worth is growing hand over fist every single month. Right. But I'm not always incredibly liquid. I have to pass on investment opportunities all the time. So... Probably the same idea. I, I'm not a dad yet. Uh, I know you are, but I've I've had a lot of friends who had a kid, and they leveled up the second they had that kid financially. Yes. Like targets that they could never hit because now it's like this is a set. This has to happen. Versus I've been kind of comfortable and wasting my life away. So 
sounds like the same idea putting your back yep. against the wall and now you have to make it happen. Yep. Um, some, so, so when I, when I started getting into it and again, I'm just scratching the surface, I was terrified cause I didn't understand. So I grabbed a few books. I just put them out here, but like Ray Dalio, um, the intelligent investor, all those old school books that got me into it. So I could understand the terminology and that got me past the fear. So I could at least understand what I'm reading, any books you'd recommend. I know you guys have a lot of resources, so maybe some resources you have and then any books that were game changers for you. So someone who wants to get into it can at least intellectually start understanding it. Yeah, I think the book uh, that started it for me, like back in the day, is you, you start reading things like, this is pro- this might sound really basic, but like Rich Dad Poor Dad, and you realize that, okay, well, there are people that don't have to work for money anymore. You know, their money works for them. I think uh, you have Intelligent Investor there, which is fantastic. Um, I think it really gets down to like the core of what someone's trying to learn. Are they trying to learn real estate? Are they trying to learn crypto? Right. You know, if you want to learn about Bitcoin, there's a book called The Bitcoin Standard, which is really about fiat currency and Bitcoin and all of it together, which is which is awesome. But I think part of why I'm writing this book, uh, Levels of Wealth, is I think there are some good books. There are some good podcasts. But people people want to know for me, like especially now, like they're like, give me the books that I can read, like what you just said. I'm like, well, I need to give you 50 or it's not going to work right. uh, because every book has like this, they're writing it from yeah. one perspective. And so I'm, I'm really wanting to democratize some of these lessons and keep it narrow. Like this is just about how to multiply money. Here's how money works. Here's how it doesn't work. And here's how you multiply it in these three different asset classes. And that's what levels of wealth will be about. It's kind of how do you track your money? How do you plan out for what you need? Create your targets, liquidity, cash flow, burn, et cetera, like all of the things, like you know, things that you've probably heard me teach about before. Um, but that will be out next year. But I'm gearing up to start doing some, like I'm going to show up on YouTube as well so, and I start putting that. out videos. Because I'm like, man, I, I, it's not an ego thing. It's just like when you're sitting in a meeting with like Blackstone, and it's like, okay, well, these guys have more money than anyone, and here's how they think about institutional grade investments. It's like, you can't get that in a book. It just doesn't, right. the book doesn't exist, you know? Right. And right. so what I'm looking to do in the next phase of business and life is take a lot of these concepts that are coming out of boardrooms and they're coming out of like, Hey, we invested in you know, We just, we're building right now developments in Charlotte and here's how we thought about it. Here's how we made the decision and here's how the math works. And so whether you're rich or poor or somewhere in between, Here's what you can do to get started on your journey towards a better, more vibrant and healthy financial future. And, uh, you know, I wish I had more book recommendations. I just feel like I feel like it's a pretty big gap in the market right now. And you're, you probably are noticing the same thing where it's like there's a big gap between Rich Dad, Poor Dad and Intelligent 100%. Investor. Like there's a massive gap there. 100%. And then half the stuff that Benjamin talked about doesn't work anymore because we have freaking yeah. Uber. Like he didn't have Uber back then. There's no such yeah. thing really as like assets aren't undervalued as much anymore. There's not yeah. as there's not as as easy of an on ramp for value investing that there used to be. So I'm working on it. That's all. That's long story short, I'm working on it. Well, I, I mean, it's why I love the internet. YouTube and podcasts have. I still read a lot. And my 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 Amazon bill has gone from probably a thousand dollars a month in books to ever since I kind of joined the TNF world and just started. It's like 2,000, 2,500. There's always some book yeah. and I buy it. There's yeah. so many books I still haven't read. I got to get on a stricter schedule. But um, YouTube, I, uh, the gap that I have found has been on YouTube and podcasts where real financial people who've been in the markets for 30 years are talking about real stuff. And it, it seems to be changing so fast right now with the adoption of crypto and, and just the speed that things are moving at. So one, one of the things looking for that. One other thing that I'll just put out there is the problem too with a lot of the books or a lot of the resources is they all think that their way is the best way. You want to be really careful with somebody who's like, this is the only way to do it. Or you can only do multifamily. You can only do single family. It's like, you know what? You're actually, when you, when you hear that, just know you can probably learn from this person, but you're listening to a salesman. You're not listening to a teacher. And so I think people just need to be careful um, that they don't fall into that trap. Like this is the only way to do it. You you can do single family residential vacation. You can do crypto DeFi. You can invest in strip malls. You can get into nothing but whole life insurance. It really doesn't matter. 
what matters is that you figure out some of the rules and you build the allocation that's right for you yeah. uh, and yeah. go from there. So that's something I to watch out for. I understand for. The, the marketing, why they do that. But the second I hear that, it's like this little, I understand marketing, yeah. so I get it. I'm like, okay, yeah. I get your point of view. It's great for you. Um, yeah. Okay, as, as we wrap things up, um, if I'm, I'm huge on learning from people's mistakes and I'll just look at someone who's been doing something for 40 years. I'm like, what are your three biggest or two biggest or biggest regrets? So at least I can be aware of it on my radar. Anything that you've learned over the last five or six years that you're like, if I would have known this a little ahead of time, I could have avoided a lot of wasted time, effort, money down the drain. Any any holes that we can watch out for as we set off on this journey of wealth? Yeah, I, th this is like the textbook answer, but I really do wish that I would have started putting money into asset classes sooner. Um, like I was making a lot of money in 2017, in 2018. I really didn't start putting money I put a little bit of money into the market in 2019, but we didn't start going heavy until 2020. Um, oh. We bought $400,000 of assets in 2019 and 21 million in 2020. Wow. So oh. I, yeah. I wish I would have started sooner, but I think to give people like more of a, a, a bird's eye view, I, I do think that the, the thing that has cost me the most money uh, is fear. Is fear. It's getting over that. There, there is always an element of human nature where it doesn't matter how high you go or how much you win or how talented you are. Um, if you let your motivation come from fear, if you let your choices come from fear, uh, it will cost you more than it makes you always. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, there's, there's always a gut check for me when I'm making a big decision. And I always want to know, am I making this decision because I'm afraid of something? Uh, am I not making this decision because I'm afraid of something? Because some of the biggest... Some of the worst decisions you make is the decision to not, to not make the decision. And it, it usually comes down to some experience you had in the past that you're afraid to reproduce. And then by being afraid of it, you, re, you recreate it. And so even, even now, like, you know, everything that we've done and all that we've accomplished and all that we're going on to accomplish is still a thing for me of just like making sure that my choices are coming from a place of vision and what could this look like? What's the possibility here? Who could this help? Not from a place of fear or scarcity or lack, you know? Right. So that would be the biggest lesson. That'd be, that's the biggest regret of all time. So cool. So cool. Um, huge thank you. And I, I mean that like, like actually, I actually mean that is the identity shift that happened. That's the biggest thing I learned is great. You can keep learning how to make more money and all that, but what's the next level of the game. And just, this has been such a fascinating journey for me. Uh, tons of self-discovery, tons of fears, tons of checking something and seeing 30 grand done in a day, which is a new experience to me, but it's just helped me level up and I'm excited for the next level. I'm excited for YouTube channel and everything you're doing, I think is, um, again, I think you're filling a huge gap and there's not many guys from the marketing and internet world who have, from what I know, transitioned into where you guys are going, which is really, really cool to me. Yeah, it's going to be fun. I'm excited. So cool. If people want to find you, I'll have all the links below. I know you have the uh, the taylorworlds.com forward slash buy, which we did not talk about, but I know you guys are buying companies or looking to buy yep. companies, businesses. Yep. Yep. Just helping people grow, scale, and exit. So cool. Levels of wealth. Um, I know the YouTube channel is out. I actually checked it out this morning. You have a few hundred subscribers without even having a video out. I know you guys are starting to ramp that up. So I'll have a link to the YouTube channel. Um, anything else? I think Twitter is your main area of focus right now. Yeah, it is right now. In fact, if, if you actually, people can, I update this, the team will update this probably every month. Um, TaylorAWelch.com slash links, just L-I-N-K-S. And it just kind of takes somebody to, it's like, here's everything I'm working on at the moment. Uh, we've got market movers, which is fascinating. We didn't even talk about that, but that's, that's going to blow up. It's going to be a news company. It to be awesome. Um, cool. wealth cap, both wealth cap brands, traffic funnel sales mentor IA is, is rocking and rolling. Now we've got the new book. There's a new podcast coming out of these. Like there's so much stuff going so on, but if people so can just crazy. hit that links URL, they'll kind of see a list of everything going on. So that's what we'll do. Taylor, thanks for cool. your time. Thank you. Thanks for everything. Appreciate you.